We head north right now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Michael Grange covers the Raptors in the NBA for Rogers Sportsnet. Joins me. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Doing good. So it, give, the, give the audience a little perspective in you know, what is the mood up there right now in Toronto because the, this is a Raptors team that is on the verge of history. They win tonight. It's their first ever NBA Finals. So give the folks listening just an idea of what, what is the mood, what is the environment like up there in Toronto today? It's kind of giddy, uh, a little bit nervous. Um, as you point out, I mean, this is a, a first for the franchise. And, look, there's a lot of teams in the NBA that can relate to either not having won forever or, or maybe, you know, been not having been to a final. And But I think in, in Toronto's case, what's always a little bit unique is the, as the only Canadian team, um, it's, t- it's taken, it feels like, and, Torontonians would tell you, Canadians would tell you, it just feels like it's taken a long time to get the attention, to, to get the respect, and, you know, to be this close of, of you know, a place where, you, you know, you can't deny what the franchise has done and what the fan base has, has, has stuck around for and the way it's grown and the way, it, you know, the, the, the sport and the culture has kind of infiltrated the fabric of the city is, is kind of spectacular. And this is this would be this moment has the potential to be kind of like the icing on the cake. Now, the only problem is they haven't won yet. <laughs> so, right. And so, uh, you know, everyone are excited by the chances because they're at home, they're game six, and they seem to have uh, sort of got the Bucks number. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, these things, as we know, can change fast. Was there a moment or a point, you know, just kind of macro perspective over the years, because this is a Raptors franchise that came about – in the mid 1990s, and for a lot of us, you know, in this area of the country, you know, when you think of Toronto, you think of maybe hockey. Before you think of basketball, you think of the Blue Jays because they beat the Phillies. You know, so when, when did for basketball and for the Raptors franchise, when did that city finally start really embracing and the fan base really come alive in your in your view? It's come in stages. Right, the team was really well received when it arrived. There was always a basketball kind of starved fan base here and, and so if you got people sort of my age kind of forties, fifties, like you know, you were waiting for something like this to show up at your doorstep and when it did it was very exciting. And then the Vince Carter era, um, you know, that kinda of, that kind of galvanized a whole generation of, of, of well, multiple generations. But, you know, so so people who are kind of season ticket holders now, they're in their thirties, they grew up with this team. They're Vince Carter babies. Drake is very representative of that. I mean he is quintessential after fan in a way and just his age and, and, and where the team evolved over his kind of, you know, young adulthood and adulthood. Um, and where the team is now, it, it, it's kind of really interesting because the city itself, it's like a really interesting demographic story, right? The, the, the city is uh, very, very diverse and has rapidly become very diverse um, in the last sort of almost in lockstep with the arrival of the Raptors. And, and um, and I think where the team is now is is a lot of populations that came into the city and into this country as you know first generation maybe now second generation Canadians from all over the world. Uh, this was the team they gravitated to, and that they're now like a really thriving, vibrant, accepted, um, essential <laughs> part of, of of the community, of the city, of the economy, of everything around it. And and so when you go to a Raptors game here, it's uh, it's it's if you would take a, a photo or a snapshot of 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 what's going to look like in that building tonight, or does at any regular season game, and then overlay that over what a, a hockey crowd might have looked like 20 years ago, it's a, two different cities, two different places, and yet um, you, you know the beauty of it, I think, is the Raptors has really become something that that uh, sort of this new, younger, more diverse element of the culture can celebrate as part of their own and yet I think it's kind of easily crossed over into um, what was here before and, and so it's kind of brought it's kind of been a, a unifying thing I mean maybe that's probably getting a little too very silly but it's uh, there's there's something to it it's hard to put it into words and, um, and it's it's you know so moments like this get very very exciting for all kinds of reasons like that. Michael Graines joining me on the World Wakanda Hotline on 97.3 ESPN covers the Raptors and NBA for Rogers Sportsnet. 
let's look at specifically the game tonight then. We saw that in the last home game for the Raptors, the supporting cast really stepped up, especially guys off the bench. I mean, the bench was on fire, and, and the Bucks just didn't seem to have really get any traction. Is that one of the keys in your mind tonight? If the guys coming off the bench, the supporting cast for the Raptors, if they step up, is that the big key in your mind tonight? It's been the big key to get them here. Uh, you know, the starters, the bench have been non-existent, really, from the Philly series, as we know, and, and the first maybe couple of games of, of against the Bucks, and the Stars were running out of gas, man. Like, there, there was no way it was sustainable that they were going to be playing 40 minutes exclusively. Um, and then just whatever bench minutes were doled out, the guy, the Raptors were getting killed. Um, and so it, it started in a little bit in the blowout in game two. Norm Powell came out of nowhere and had a really good game. And, and then in game three, uh, that double overtime game, they got just enough. Uh, from some of the bench guys, no, no problem being another. And then the real turning point of the series was maybe was game four when Kawhi Leonard, exhausted from that double overtime game in game three, kind of had to take a step aside. Like, he just didn't have anything to give. And then you had Fred Van, Fred Van Vliet come out of nowhere. Norm Powell have a huge game. And, and just some of the supporting cast kind of proved themselves. And so they're in a really good place right now going into game six where – you know, they're only really playing three bench guys, but they all have had really good games very recently and feel good about their game. And then Leonard seems to be rejuvenated after kind of a real, like, lull in game four. And Kyle Lowry's playing at a high level. And just about everyone on this roster can point to a huge contribution made in this series, with the exception of maybe Danny Green. And, uh, and you know, there's no reason that can't turn around pretty quickly. So um, I think... You know, they could go two ways tonight. I mean, I, they could, if they had to, they could roll their starters and play them for 35, 40 minutes if that's what they needed and do it. But uh, the fact that they're able to go to the bench and get some get some sparks uh, makes them, you know, a really dangerous team. You mentioned Kyle Lowry, and I've heard you talk about before how, how intelligent he is as a basketball player and how, you know, he, he really is at times been a stabilizing presence for this team. And, it feels like in this series, more than any other series, he has really elevated his game. And, you know, a lot of the national perspective on him has been, and is Kyle Lowry going to show up in the playoffs? But it seems like he has, if not, you could say, almost exceeded expectations in this series. You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of analogies that pop to mind, right? But, but championship-level teams require multiple all-star contributions but those also sort of have to be in the proper slot. So you're not going to win a World Series without, like, you know, really deep starting pitching. Um, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean all your pitchers have to be number one pitchers. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and in, in to follow the analogy, even if it's not very good, is right, right now Kyle Lowry's properly slotted. And the moments where Lowry did at times struggle in the playoffs, a, he was more younger in his career. B, the team around him was much younger. And C, he had a much bigger role, probably a bigger role at the highest levels of the NBA than he's suited to carrying. And so the role he's in now, he's uh, probably the third, uh, maybe some nights the fourth offensive option, but that, you know, he, but he's in a position to kind of ramp up, that up with if, if, if and when needed. And he's shown a really good uh, feel for times when he really needs to assert himself offensively and get the team over a hump. Um, and then that in turn gives him a lot more energy and freedom to, to kind of run the team as a playmaker and then defensively just sort of be a disruptor and, and, and his intelligence as a team defender really shines. And so that's, I think, a really good way to explain why this team, Raptors team is really good. It's Kyle Lowry, you know, five-time All-Star, uh, you know, super league player in the 13th year. Um He's maybe on some nature first best player, and that's usually a good sign. And, and, and I think that's one reason Powell's had a great playoffs is he's been able to play within himself too much, play with him, within himself enough and, uh, and pick his spots to really shine. And uh, he's really struck a good formula that way. And one of the reasons why he has that role now is also because of the fact that over the last 12 months, the man at the top, Masai Ujiri, has made – Two serious gambles. You know, he went and acquired Kyle, uh, Kawhi Leonard without having a contract in place. He made the trade for Marcus Gasol before the deadline. You know, what does it say about Uziri that he's got this team 
on the doorstep of the NBA Finals after making you know two trades that I think a lot of people you know were saying, wow, that's that, that's a pretty big gamble to make those two kind of moves just in the last twelve months. Yeah, and don't forget, he also fired Dwayne Casey, <laughs> who right. was uh, the NBA Coach of the Year, and it was a fifty-nine win season, um, and replaced him with his assistant because he couldn't. Uh, either couldn't or didn't want to hire Mike Budenholzer, who goes on and wins the Coach of the Year this year, or is going to win the Coach of the Year this year. So that's, that's three giant moves. Any one of those moves for a team at the level the Raptors are, which was you know a perennial a conference final contender, five straight playoff years, 50-win type seasons, 60-win type seasons, um, any one of those would have been big moves. Um, but to pull in three of them <laughs> you know, in, in that short of time and really have them all pan out, Obviously, Kawhi Leonard uh, worked out to be healthy and is delivering Hall of Fame caliber playoff performances every night. And, you know, Marcus Gasol has been, you know, also not just, he's been, was a hugely productive player. But Marcus Gasol, they wanted more IQ. They wanted a guy who could create some plays offensively when, when teams were over committing to either Leonard or, or Lowry. And uh, and they got it, and he's delivered. It hasn't always been smooth, smooth but it's, it's he's definitely come through it at the key times. And Nick Nurse, uh, first year NBA head coach, uh, last head coaching experience was in the G League. Um, you know, kind of an unknown in, in coaching circles, uh, has gone head to head with some pretty good coaches here in the postseason, and has come out and and on the better and better end, or has a chance to go out on the better end three straight times. So. Uh, if you're Masai Jiri as, as a president, general manager, um, you know you're you know to go three for three on swings that big is uh, we all know that doesn't happen very often, and uh, you know you got to give credit for someone to have the nerve to do it. Michael Green is joining me on the World Walk on the Hotline here on 97.3 ESPN again. Bucks Raptors tonight. You hear the coverage after Blackjacks football on 97.3. ESPN game six tonight Michael before I let you go I want to get your perspective you know it's been a topic obviously all over the media Drake the whole the whole of his fandom the shenanigans everyone's got a view on it I want to know from you what's the view in Toronto though of Drake (laughs) and all this because look let's be realistic realistically Drake's only at the home game it's not like he's traveling with the team to every game so, right. you know, to me, I really want to know what does the city of Toronto think of all of this? I think in a large measure, the city of Toronto loves Drake. <laughs> and, and he is kind of like the epitome of that fandom I was talking about earlier in, the, in our conversation. He's the ultimate. He's, the, he's the, 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 the guy, all the guys, you know, all the kids, all the young people. Um, sitting in the 500 levels, wish they were. And, and he's kind of, and I think what they love about him is for a guy in that situation, he's, you know, he wants everyone to know how much fun he's having. And it's kind of like they live through him. So so you won't get, uh, Drake pretty much walks on water around here. There are some people, I mean, it kind of breaks down a little bit on age line. So, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, a little bit older than some of the crowd, and, and I'm like, hey, look, I love it. It's awesome. Love the passion. But, like, you know, stay off the floor. <laughs> Maybe not try to get in the face of opposing players. Uh, you know, I, I, I watched Reggie Miller. I knew what he did this fight, right? So careful what you wish for there. But, um, you know, but that'd be my only comment is, is I think when you're starting to venture into coaching boxes and find out and onto the floor, well, maybe you're, you're overstepping your bounds a little bit. But, no, this is this is not your average celebrity fan, right? Like he's he's uh, he does have a title role with the franchise. He's the, the his business is the title sponsor of the of the practice facility. They wear his jerseys. They have Drake nights. You know, he's uh, he's a, a friend of all the players. So it's it's not uh, you know it's not like your standard uh, you know uh, like I say celebrity fan. It's a little deeper than that, but. Um, you know, it's uh, it'll all be fun and games until you know he gets he causes a couple of technical fouls and I don't know Malcolm Brogdon goes off for 15 points in five minutes while you have him back and forth. So we'll see. <laughs> but it's fun. I mean, you know what? What? Uh, let's face it. Like the Raptors are a team that's easy to ignore. And the only unfortunate thing about this series is, 
you know, the Bucks are the exact same franchise, right? Like, like who cares about the Bucks? Like, they're equally honest. They've got their own tortured history. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you can only feel good for them that they've got Giannis and that they've got this beautiful building and, and all of those kinds of things. So it's a little bit of a shame that, that uh, one of these two teams is not going to get their moment. But it looks to me the Bucks got a little more runway on that. So, uh, so you know, maybe the Raptors got to strike while they're in hot. Follow him on Twitter at Michael Grains covers the Raptors in the NBA for Rogers Sportsnet. History can be made tonight. Game six, Bucks versus Raptors here on 97.3 ESPN FM. Michael, appreciate your time today. Hey, thank you. Anytime.